Well, it's absolutely great to be here with you uh, today and to just be able to share the word of the Lord. I trust that our time together will be a fruitful, fruitful time. And uh, I'm so uh, honored at the invitation of uh, Pastor Chris to be here. And uh, I even celebrate the spiritual father who um, was a visionary and listened to the voice of God to be able to make transition and watch the church of the Lord Jesus Christ move forward. I bring you greetings from Atlanta, where I'm from and where I pastor, about 20,000 people there in the city. And, uh, but I, I pray that just our time together today will be a fruitful time. Uh, the older that I get, uh, uh, you know, this month I have been teaching the Word of God uh, every single week without fail for the last 45 years, 45 years. It's, it's been an incredible journey as I have sojourned in the land. <laughs> I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to God. And, and uh, you know, I, 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 I come from the hair cosmetic manufacturing company. We, we, we study hair. We, we, we really do. And we manufacture several products there. And uh, my oldest brother is our chemist that has developed all of our formulas. And it's interesting, uh, uh, men have basically three styles, uh, parted hair, unparted hair, and departed hair. <laughs> and, and then we have studied balding extensively. You know, the men that ball from, you know, front going backwards, those men are great thinkers. The ones that ball from the center of the head, those men are sexy. And then the men who ball from the front going to the back, and then the back meets it, and then it's what I call the cul-de-sac. Those are men who think that they are sexy. <laughs> it's interesting. It's very, very interesting. Tell your neighbor, say, I like this guy already. I like him already. I have, I, I have learned as I have, uh, have, have, have gotten older that there's, there's something that every age of life teaches us. I have a special affinity to people that have gray hair, particularly because mine has turned. And uh, uh, there is something in, in, in God's economy and God's kingdom that is available for every person, no matter what stage you are in life. It doesn't matter whether you're in your tender teens, your teachable 20s, your tireless 30s, your forcible 40s, your fearful 50s, your seasoned 60s, yeah. your settled 70s, your aching 80s your nebulous 90s, or your prodigious hundreds. Wherever you are, there's something for absolutely everyone. Uh, when I find out new things, particularly the older that we get, the more that we actually want to learn how to live longer. I learned this from a, uh, a dean of a seminary down in Australia, a friend of mine, as I, we were ministering together over in Europe. And when I learned new information that helped me, then I want to share it with you. Just, just quickly. But he said, you know, the average lifespan is about 70 years. Add or subtract a few numbers, you know. And, uh, but a room with a view, having a room with a view adds two years onto your life. Just having a room with a view adds on two years to your life. Living with clutter subtracts one year from your life. Living with clutter. Caring for a pet adds two years to your life. Noise pollution subtracts one year from your life. Now, this next one, it seems so unfair, but I'm going to talk to the Lord about it when I get to heaven. But being female adds 10 years to your life. 10 years for being female. Being married adds seven years onto your life. Getting a divorce subtracts three years from your life. Being happy adds nine years to your life. Low self-esteem subtracts four years from your life. Insufficient sleep subtracts five years from your life. Having faith adds seven years to your life. So once I learned this new information, you know, I think that belief should turn into behavior. And so here's my new resolution that when I turn 70, I'm going to get a room with a view I'm going to buy a pet, I'm going to stay married, I'm going to remain happy, I'm going to keep the faith, and that means that I'll live until I'm 97, and at 97, I'm going to have gender reassignment to a woman, and I'll live to be 107 years old. 
It's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. I'm going to talk to you today about four simple words, four simple words that I heard the Lord speak to me, just, just four, just simple words. And the first word actually comes from Exodus chapter 3 and verse 2 and 3, where there the angel of the Lord appeared to, to Moses in the flame of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. The first word here is the word attention. Attention. Can you say attention with me? Listen, those who are joining by video, if you're joining, listen, attention is very, very critical. God had to get Moses' attention. Before he can speak to us, he has to get our attention. Whenever you speak to your children, your grandchildren, you want to have their attention. And and, and here's the deal. We have more time than we have attention. Just because a person is giving you their time does not mean that they're giving you their attention. It bothers me. I'm I'm old-fashioned. But I grew up with a strong father in the house, and he had six sons. He didn't start his family until he was 40 years old. My daddy was 50 when I was born. I'm son number four out of six. He had my younger brother at 55. He had my baby brother at 60. And uh, we would be sitting there for dinner, and uh, the telephone would ring, and he wouldn't allow anybody to answer it. And while we ate, the television had to be off so that we talked to each other, and we gave each other our undivided attention. We didn't just have family time together. We had attention. When God spoke to Moses, he had to set a bush on fire to get his attention. Something out of the ordinary to be able to get the man's attention. And sometimes there are various things that God will use in your life just to get your attention. Sometimes it's just repetition. He'll let you hear something on, 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 uh, on television, see something online, hear something in a conversation, read something in a book, and it's a recurring thing of what you've heard God speak to you in your spirit, and it's a confirming word, and you realize this is not a coincidence. This is God trying to get my attention about this issue. God is talking to me. God can use tragedy to get your attention. He can use the loss of life. He can use sickness just to get your attention. There are some people that when things are going too well in your life, we don't give God our attention. So he has to wait until we experience loss just to have our attention. He's trying to get our attention so that he can speak to us because there's something that God wants each of us to do. He wants something from each of us. We... uh, 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 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 talks about the fact that we are both saved and called. Saved and called. Saved and called. It's not enough just to be saved. If, if salvation was the culmination of God's purpose, as soon as we got saved, he would beam us up to heaven. But then we're supposed to be the church to the unchurched. We're supposed to be salt and light. So God does something to get our attention. He has to give you, if it were, as a Saul, Paul, uh, a Damascus Road experience just to get Paul's attention. He was just volleying, you know, volleying, trying to get his attention. What is God setting on fire in your life to get your attention? God can use a pandemic just to get our attention and make the whole world stop. I was over in Germany speaking for the U.S. military when the pandemic broke out. I had two more sessions to do. But I said, you know, America is shutting down if I'm not there by Friday night and I got to go. And I left. It got my attention. But I'm so glad because once God gets our attention, he then begins to talk to us about the real issue. You know, the thing that I discover is that evil 
is a byproduct of forgetfulness. Evil is a byproduct of laziness. And evil is a byproduct of distraction. Can you imagine how much digital distraction that we have in our world? Uh, not only just, just with the natural things of hyperactivity disorder and attention deficit disorder, but just the digital distraction with notifications and wondering who has responded to me, who has liked my picture, who has done this or that or the other. And we are so digitally distracted and people are so busy in their work that God has to sometimes do things out of the ordinary to interrupt our normalcy just to get our attention. And it was because there was the content of what would come out of a voice once God just set a bush on fire just so that Moses would turn aside as he was sojourning and see something that would arrest his attention so that he would listen to God. And so the first thing that God wants to do is to get our attention. is to say just, hey, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Back in the day, if an older person spoke to you and you didn't respond to them, you'd better watch out because maybe a shoe or something else was coming through the air. <laughs> Just a signal to you that, hey, hey, I'm talking to you. Do you hear me? They would send you something tangible <laughs> that nowadays people would probably call defects on you or over, but they would send some tangible thing to let you know. Uh, I want, I'm talking to you. I need your attention. I've got to say something to you. So God gets our attention because time is different than attention. And how often do we have time with God where we're in our own personal devotional time, but our minds are worrying about something else in the world? And you're talking to God. God's trying to talk to you about his word. And you're thinking about your children, your grandchildren, things on your job, what's happening with your pension fund. You're wondering about all kinds of things, about your health. And we are distracted. And God's setting things on fire just to try to get our attention. The next word is the word potential. There are four simple words. Attention, potential. Because in Exodus Chapter 4 and verse 2, God simply asked Moses, Moses, what's that in your hand? And we know what it was. It was a rod, a staff. It spoke of his potential, what he was capable of doing. It's, this is just about potentiality. God wants to show us what we are capable of doing. There was a young man by the name of Danny Simpson uh, in the year... Uh, 1990, he actually, in 94, he, he was in Ottawa, Canada, and he went in because he needed money and robbed a bank at gunpoint at Ottawa, Canada. And it didn't take long at all for the police department to apprehend him. He was apprehended and they confiscated the weapon that he used to rob the bank and he made away with almost $6,000. And then he received a sentence, a prison sentence of six years in prison for $6,000, a little less than $6,000. The Ottawa Police Department there in Canada then had the, the weapon that he used to rob the bank analyzed, and they discovered that it was not an ordinary gun, it was an antique and, and here it was that he was carrying a 45 caliber Colt semi-automatic pistol, one of only 100 that was made by the Ross Rifle Company in 1918. And when they had it evaluated, its worth was estimated of upwards of $100,000. Almost 20 times the amount that he made away from with the bank. Now here he's got in his hand a pistol worth $110,000 and he robs a bank for less than $6,000 because he didn't understand what was in his, in his hand. And when you carry something in your present, it can cause you to abort your future if you don't understand its value. And so here now God is speaking 
to Moses who's got something in his hands, everything that he needs in order to get the job done, to get the children of Israel out of Egypt, he's got a staff. God was saying to him prophetically, you don't have to do this yourself. Staff your weaknesses. You've got something. It is the anthropomorphic hand of the Lord that says, use what you've got. It, it says really when it speaks of the hand, it means that it's within reach. You don't have to do it yourself. It has to just be within reach. Who is within reach? What is within reach of your own life? So once God gets your attention, he will talk to you about your potential. Your potential is never based on what you have done. Your potential is always about what you haven't done yet. Uh, he hadn't worked one miracle yet, but he had the potential. He hadn't parted a sea yet, but he had the potential. It was in his hands the whole time. And God got his attention to talk about his potential. What do you carry that you don't realize the worth and the value? This young 26-year-old boy by the name of Danny Simpson that robbed a bank in Canada, the only reason that he's robbing a bank is because he didn't understand the value of what he had in his hand. He didn't understand the value of what he had inherited. And he was carrying something that he had inherited that he was able to even steal from a bank. And it sometimes strikes me that when we don't understand the heritage that we carry, when we don't understand the value of history and others that have paid a price for where we are and for what we have, it can cause us to be stifled in our ability because I realize that I'm building on the shoulders of my father. I inherited something. It is, it's much more to me than something that was made yesterday. This is proven by time. There are some new concepts now that our world is trying to issue out to us, and they haven't been proven. But when you get the faith of our fathers, it has been tested, time tested, proven. So God gets your attention, attention, attention. Because sometimes the attention is about where you are and sometimes it's about who you're with. Because let me say this to you. Whenever God wants to strengthen your life, he'll bring a person into your life. And whenever the devil wants to weaken your life, he'll bring a person into your life. The key is discernment. To know, is this a gift from God to strengthen me? Or is this a demonic distraction sent from the enemy to weaken me in my faith? To weaken me in my commitment? To weaken me in, in what God has called me to do by destiny? Discernment. Discernment. So God gets our attention so that he can speak to us about our potential because you've got more in your hand than what you realize. There's much more in your hand that you have the potential of being able to do. Here's one of the things that I realized. You never ever have to pursue that which you have the power to attract. Why would I have to go chasing something if I can give a call and attract it to me? You never have to pursue what you have the power to attract. Our lives, as we realize it, is either lived by design or it's lived by default. By design or by default. Use your potential. What's your purpose? What's your potential that God has given you already in your hand? What do you carry in your hand already? The first word is attention. The second word is potential. Because after God got Moses' attention, he talked to him about his potential. What's in your hand? Use what you've got to get what you want. The kingdom of God is built on a seed principle. And the reason that God puts your future in the microcosm of a seed is because it's the only way that you can carry the future right now. A little girl, when she's born, has all of the eggs that she will ever have. Girls don't manufacture eggs. They are born with all the eggs that they'll ever have. And around 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, those eggs start maturing once per month. One from the left ovary, one from the right. And they alternate month by month because they've carried the potential of it all of their life. 
They don't get more eggs. They don't manufacture eggs. They just release what is matured. And there are some of us that are waiting to be released, and God's waiting on us to be matured. Because maturity does not come with age. It comes with the acceptance of responsibility. And when we accept responsibility and say, Lord, I'm responsible. Here am I, Lord. Send me. When we count ourselves in to the economy of God, after he gets our attention, and then he realizes everything that you've given, I've given to you in your hand. The past is in your head. The future is in your hand. So for it. It's in your hand. It's a seed goes in the hand. And it's what you release out of your hand that determines the harvest that comes back into your life. Attention, potential. Here's the third word, intention. Intention. God gave Moses a divine intention when he said, go down to, to Egypt and talk to Pharaoh. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 22 and 23. And he said, tell him, let my people go. He gave him a divine intention. He didn't go there to waste time. He went there with a divine intention. He went with a divine intention so that he could liberate God's people and bring them to a land of promise. And Egypt is a type of the world trying to keep us from the destiny that we have in the, in, in, in the economy of God, in God's plans for us. When he said it in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God knows those plans. What is your intention? What is your intention? Back, back in the day when a, when a young man was interested in talking to a young woman, it was not uncommon that the father would want to know what, what are your intentions with my daughter? What are your intentions? Because the intentions reveal something about the heart. Once God gets your attention and you understand your potential, he then gives you a divine intention with that potentiality so that you don't discover power and don't have the, the integrity of heart to be able to use it in a proper and God-glorifying way. Don't find your potential, your ability, and then don't discover why you've got it. If, if you don't understand why God gave you your beauty, You'll prostitute yourself. But when Anesta understood her beauty, she understood that this is not about me. This is about my people. I was born on purpose, with purpose, and for purpose. Yeah. And, and this is why she had a commitment that rose up in her heart that if I perish, I perish. But she understood that her beauty was not so that she could just attract men. It was a favor that God gave to her to be able to win the heart of the king so that she could become a prophetic intercessor. And Mordecai is a type of the Holy Ghost that was speaking to her behind the scenes, letting a beautiful young woman understand that your purpose here is not so that you can become a sex symbol. This is so that you can use your influence. God gave you a platform so that you can use it for the glory of God. A stage is for performance, but a platform is for influence. And when God builds a platform in your life, whether you're an athlete, whether you're a singer, whether you're a dancer, or whether you're an artist, when God builds a platform, it's for influence for his purpose. And we have to find out, God, for what purpose am I born? Why did you give this to me? Why do I have this gift? Why am I so talented? Why do I have this passion? Why? It's the divine intention. Attention, potential, intention. Here's the fourth word. Retention. It's not about what you get. It's about what you retain. Why would God want to waste his voice with us if he didn't retain anything that he had to say to us? It's so interesting that it is about our being able to retain. And that's why God told Moses, after all of the miracles of Egypt, he says, build an ark of the covenant. And I want you to put a pot of manna in there. I want you to put the Ten Commandments. There's some things out of the journey that you've lived that ought to be retained for the next generation. You ought to be able to retain it. And that's why I say, listen, one of the greatest gifts that you could ever give, 
would be to take a journal and write down the things that God has taught you. The life lessons, the testimonies of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news of the gospel. Put it in a journal. Can you imagine what a treasure it would have been for you to have been given when you reached adulthood four journals? Two from your maternal grandparents and two from your paternal grandparents. Can you imagine if your, both of your grandmothers and both of your grandfathers had just left you a book, not money, a book? When Jesus left us, the only thing that he left was his book to be able to retain his words. Can you imagine if you have the ability, and you do, to be able to leave a journal with the records of what God will have done in your life. To speak to the next generation, to be able to give it to them. Four books, let it start with you. Let it start with you. I'm writing mine for my grandchildren and for my great-grandchildren. They'll have it in my words. And make Jesus the star of it. Because there is glory in every story. Tell them about what he has done. Put it in writing. If you think it, ink it. A short pencil is worth more than a long memory. Put it in writing. We write for memorability. We write for posterity. And we write for accuracy. They don't have to wonder whether you said it this way or that way. Put it in writing. Leave your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, a book with what God has done in you. Leave them the richness of the life lessons, things that you had to learn the hard way. The greatest lessons of life are not learned in a course. They are learned on a course as you sojourn. I've learned more on the journey than I have in a course. You learn it on this course that we call life. And then take notes for the next generation. It becomes their cliff notes. It gives strength to them. It gives advantage to them. Just It, it gives them a God perspective. It's wonderful to know how God delivered Daniel out of the lion's den and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego out of a fiery furnace. But your grandchildren need to know how you got out of your den when you were feeling depressed. They need to know how you were able to overcome challenges physically, health-wise, and the faithfulness of God when things happened that you had not planned on because there are some detours on the journey. But may I suggest to you that even though you may take a detour, your son or your daughter may take a detour, God still knows where they are and where the destiny is. And he's able to recalibrate like any good GPS system would do. That if you take a wrong turn, it'll tell you, make a U-turn. It'll, it'll start telling you uh, uh, the different routes that you can get back to that place in God. Because God is able to take us, even with this illusion that we might call free will and free choice, God is able to still direct us back. Because you see, your life is on a leash. When somebody has prayed for you, you're on a leash. Oh, you can go a little bit to the left and to the right, a little up and down. But as soon as you get out too far, the tension of that leash will grab you right in your, in, you're on a leash. Your prayers create a divine leash from heaven to the person that you're praying for. I prayed for one of my teachers for 10 solid years before I watched her come down my aisle of my church and give her heart to Jesus Christ. I'm, I, I said to the Lord, Lord, I'm in it for the long haul. I said, whatever it takes, God do it. God wants to retain something out of everything that you've worked for. What do you retain to show that I have been with God? What do you retain? What do you retain? I was at St. Jude's Children's Hospital a few years ago. There was a little seven-year-old girl there dying of cancer, bald-headed, retrieving treatments. And when she was asked, are you afraid to die? This was her response. No, I'm not afraid to die. She said, I'm afraid, at seven years old, I'm afraid of not being remembered. She felt as though she hadn't lived long enough to do anything of significance. And that just a few years down the road, that her very existence that she was ever even on the planet 
would be erased. There's always something as God gets our attention and speaks to us of our potential and then gives us divine intention. There's something of retention that remember this. Do this in remembrance of me. And this little seven-year-old girl was so concerned about not being remembered. God can help us that when we connect and attach ourselves to the one who is eternal and an eternal purpose of being able to be a difference maker, and it doesn't take a whole lot of years to make a difference. All that it takes is a person who's submitted under the hand of God that says, God, where you want me to go, I'll go. What you want me to do, I'll do. What you want me to speak, I will speak. And you do it and serve with the heart of Jesus Christ. And you'll watch God do something that can never, ever be taken away from you. Yes, sir. And I remember this, that God's eternal value that comes to us in just divine remembrance. Just because somebody remembered you, they can remember the beauty of something. Because once you see something, you cannot unsee it. We're called to be light and salt. Let people taste your flavor and see your light. God bless you. I love you. Amen.